Okay. So um, if everyone could just keep their microphones on mute until until you need to ask a question or until the Q&A session. And by the way, everyone's free, free. feel free to interrupt me as I'm speaking. But what I plan to do is speak for a while, maybe 30, 40, 50 minutes, however long it takes to, to do the first part, and then we can open the floor up to any kind of questions. Um, as I explained in the Twitter message and the Facebook post about this, um, it occurred to me, you know, I've given lots of talks over the years on on patent and copyright law, intellectual property law, why it should be abolished, why it's unlibertarian, uh, those things, hundreds of talks probably. Um, I've only given a few talks in my life, early in my patent law career, to other lawyers mostly about patent law itself. Um, that is, you know, to business people or to patent lawyers. Um, and never, I think, never to to libertarians. And it occurs to it occurred to me the other day that it would be good for me to do this because lots of times th there's lots of confusion over the way patent and copyright law work. Um, and you know, you really need to have some idea of how it works to have a good understanding of what's wrong with it, right? And to criticize it and to understand the right solution. Um, so this is a talk not really for business people, but if anyone wants to use it practically, that's fine with me. But what I intend to do is talk about um, um, patent law today, and if this goes well and people are interested, we can do a second session on copyright law, and then maybe other sessions on other things. But the, but uh, let me just get started now. Uh, before I get started, does anyone, anyone have any questions? Is there any problem with hearing me or seeing what, what I'm doing? Okay. All right. So as I said, um, on, a slide, on page two of my slides, slide two, uh, uh, I'm going to give um, an overview. So intellectual property law is, is, a, is a subset of law. That's the laws the states enforce in different countries in the world, and there are different types of, different types of IP law. Hold on a second. I'll let Greg in. Okay. Um, the, the the big two types of IP law would be patent law and copyright law, okay. But there are others too. Uh, and let me br briefly explain something. Most of you know me from libertarian or Austrian circles um, as a libertarian writer and thinker. Um, I have been a, I've been a practicing attorney since 1992 and a patent lawyer since 93 and a registered patent attorney since. Um, since 1994. So I've been doing patent law hardcore in my career as a lawyer uh, for almost 30 years, um, about 30 years now. And I've done hundreds of patent applications for high tech companies like Intel. And um, uh, my last employer applied up to electronics and physics and laser patents, uh, um, all kinds of things like that. So I have a lot of experience with patent law and also other types of IP law like copyright and trademark. Uh, to a lesser degree, but um, that's my sort of practice, and um, I've written and spoken on those topics as well, but I've written and spoken mainly on libertarian issues and libertarian aspects of this, so that's sort of how most of you know me. Um, in any case, um, in fact, uh, practicing patent law was one reason I started investigating the morality as a libertarian of patent law because I was practicing in that field, and I started wondering… How the hell can this weird thing be justified? And I tried to do it, and I failed, and I, I failed because it's not justifiable. And I finally realized that, and when I realized that, then I started writing around the same time that I passed the patent bar. I started writing on patent law from a libertarian point of view. So they, they kind of go together, but I kind of want to focus today on the practical aspects and the real, the, the real world aspects of patent law. Okay, so now IP… Intellectual property is a term that is fairly new. It, it, people came up with it in the late mid-1800s in response to criticism of patent and copyrights, which were viewed as monopoly privileges granted by the state. And the free market economists in the 1800s started criticizing it because it's contrary to free trade. <laughs> and they started realizing this, and countries started abolishing their patent law, and they started thinking, what the hell are we doing? And uh, and then in response, the entrenched industries uh, came up with a defense because they wanted to keep copyright and patent alive because they were making money off of it, and they called it um, um, – they, they said it's not a monopoly privilege by the state. It's, it's a property right. It's an intellectual property right. It's a special type of property right. Okay, so at this point in time, there are different – in most countries, they have different subsets of IP law. 
and they all they all work differently. So the big two are copyright and patent. And in America, those are federal. That's that's a national law. Uh, the state laws have been preempted because the Constitution grants Congress the power to do this. Uh, trademark law is another type of IP law. And again, I'm going to get into patent today. I'm just going. Through a quick overview, trademark is still state-based, but with some federal aspect in the U.S. And trade secret is mostly state-based. Um, going to the next slide now. Um, uh, Marcelo, can I interrupt you one second? Sure, go ahead. Um, on the very top of your of your screen, you can put swap displays because we're looking at uh, we're not looking at PowerPoint per se. We're looking at uh, at the viewer at the present present uh, presenters view. Uh -huh. See what I'm saying? Explain, say, say again. Uh, on the very top, it says swap this place on your on your side. If you click in there, we're gonna be we're gonna look at the PowerPoint fully. I don't know if that makes sense. Do you see second. on top? I think the problem maybe I have I may have too many um, displays open. Let me let me close all my displays. And, oh, swap displays. Okay, I see it now. Um, how about that? Perfect. Much better. All right, great. Okay, then let me go up. Okay, so this was the first slide. Uh, well, here's the first the, the cover page, uh, slide number two, overview, and now the slide that we're on. Okay, so in addition to patent and copyright, which are the kind of primary types of trademark uh, of, of, patent, of intellectual property, sorry, uh, trade trademark and trade secret are the other two. But there are other types too. There are special laws like uh, boat hull designs and semiconductor mask work protection, both American-based, um, but probably boat holes. Someone, someone wanted to get protection of their boat, so they, they got that inserted into the Copyright Act. And then semiconductors because of Texas Instruments and Intel and companies like that. Uh, in some countries, there are database rights, and in some countries, there are moral rights, which is sort of the right, this, this inalienable right to, to be recognized forever as the creator of the work and also to prevent the, the owner of the work from destroying it. Uh, like you know, if you have a mural painted on your refrigerator, you can't sell your refrigerator or destroy it. Or, it's crazy. And then there are sort of special things that are not regarded as IP, but they work the same way. Like you know, it's illegal to use the NSA seal in America. There's some special statute. That's basically IP. And then, of course, as we all know, if you paint certain religious figures, pictures on the cover of a magazine, you might get killed. That's kind of a type of privately enforced IP. Um, and then there's pro always there's proposed rights like all these things um, uh, burbling up through the Congress right now about forcing people to pay, uh, for forcing internet providers to pay, and you know Google search engine and things like that, pay newspapers for using their headlines and their articles, um, or there's always agitation to add fashion designs as part of copyright or patent. Um, and then now there's talk about um, this new artificial intelligence. How they, they, you know, the AI engines like ChatGPT and the other ones, they, 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 they scour the internet for date, for images, and for text to to build their uh, their their models. And you know that's that's a type of copying. And then when they produce an output, that could be argued to be a copyright infringement to like a derivative work. So there's all kinds of applications of this kind of broad idea of intellectual property. Um, and I have talked – I have spoken about this a little bit, not about how it works, but about the types of IP in a couple of publications like my Against Intellectual Property in the first section. I think I call Summary of IP Law. I kind of try to summarize these things, and then I, I did a, a talk about 20-something years ago now um, for oil and gas lawyers when I was doing that as a, as a practice, but I was explaining patent and copyright law and IP law to them. That's an old talk, but copyright law and IP law changes slowly, so that's still pretty pretty up to date. Um, if anyone, anyone wants to look into it, and then there's all kinds of guides on on the internet, like you know the, these IP law for dummies and, 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 and things like that. Uh, but I'm going to try to go through that here. Okay, let me go through the history briefly of patents. So the patent system uh, is one of the, the 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 four main types of IP, and it's one of the two big important types, copyright being the other. Patents have to do with inventions. Copyright has to do with artistic and creative works. Um, the expression of ideas is what copyright covers. Patents cover the functionality of a process or a composition of matter, which is a pharmaceutical or a drug, or a machine, uh, an apparatus, um, usually a machine, sometimes a process. Um, now, these originated in Europe, 
And sort of the first modern incarnation of this was in 1623 in England when the the parliament got fed up with the abuses of the of the of the crown, the king, in granting patents to court cronies, which were exclusive rights to do something. Okay. So patent just means it's a Latin word patente means open. So a letter patent was an open letter. So it was basically the king writing down on a piece of paper. Mr. X has the sole exclusive right to sell this product in this region, something like that, uh, or to do this. So it was it was like an exclusive anti you know anti competitive protectionist grant that protected the person because he could show the letter to people say, listen, if, if you if you sell playing cards in this town, I I have the right to do it because of the king because this letter patent. Um, you're, you're violating the king's command. It's illegal. You're gonna you know you're gonna be arrested or penalized. Um, so that practice got out of hand because the kings would grant these things out left and right to court favorites and often in exchange for favors. So they would say, OK, you're going to go to this new territory of the crown, and we're going to give you the exclusive right to sell sheepskin, um, and you can make a lot of money because no one can compete with you. But in exchange, we want you to help us collect taxes from everyone. Okay, So it was a way of buying buying loyalty and buying um, favors from, from the – the people lower than you in the hierarchy. Uh, well, this practice got out of hand, and so Parliament reigned it in in 1623 with what they call the Statute of Monopolies because these things were seen – these letters patent were seen as um, grants of monopoly privilege and – they're monopolies. <clears throat> so the Statute of Monopolies said, look, the king cannot do this anymore. However, we're going to let him keep doing it for inventions. So you can still keep granting a letter patent to someone… If you think they've come up with some new invention, uh, some practical process or device or gizmo, um, and so the king kept granting patents on occasion for for inventions. So that's how – and nowadays we think of patents as patents for inventions, and that's because that's the only thing that remained after the Statute of Monopolies of 1623. Now, still it was a it was a, it was sort of a discretionary power of the crown. It wasn't really a bureaucracy. There was no institutionalized patent application system. You would just go to the king's. You know, um, secretaries or whoever, and say, "Look, can you please ask the king if he would give me a, a patent on this invention?" And sometimes you get it, sometimes you didn't. Later on, the process became institutionalized and democratized um, with the first General Patent Act uh, being enacted by the the colony at that time of South Carolina in America in sixteen in sixteen ninety one, um, and then. The next one, I guess, that would be of note would be after the United States, uh, after the United States was uh, was founded in 1770. Well, you could say 1776, 1785, when we when we won the uh, uh, the Revolutionary War, the War for Independence against Britain, and then um, and then in 1789 the Constitution was ratified, and as I have here on slide page number four, the, uh, Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eight. Of the Constitution, which is what grants Congress the, the limited and enumerated powers that they have, it says power has Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing to limited times for limited times. That's why patent and copyright don't last forever; they have to last for a limited finite time. To authors and inventors, the exclusive right to their writings and discoveries. Okay, and by the way, as a matter of historical curiosity. Um, the word science in the arts was used in a sort of, sort of way backwards to the way that we use them now. In the clause there, you'll see how science is listed first and goes with authors and writings. Arts goes with inventors and discoveries, and that's because the word science is part – means knowledge. right? That's why you know you have a, a conscience. It's con science. Uh, science means the um, um, uh, the art uh, means knowledge, and that referred basically basically to writings. And useful arts meant inventions because arts are things that come from artisans or you know practical makers of plows and and tools and devices. So arts meant inventions and science meant – excuse me, science meant uh, writings or knowledge. Uh, in any case, so the, the clause of the Constitution ratified in 1789 gave Congress the authority to pass patent and copyright law, not the obligation but just the right, the, the power. And so in 1790, one year later, Congress, sure enough, went ahead and enacted the first Patent Act and the first Copyright Act. 
Uh, and these were general uh, – the Patent Act in the US was a general act. It, it was like a bureaucracy. I think Thomas Jefferson was one of the first commissioners. Even though he opposed patents, oddly, in some way, he was still the first commissioner because he actually knew something about invention. Um, so that's – and then other countries of the world in Europe started following suit in the 1800s soon after that, and patent law started becoming a thing, um, and now it's a big thing. Um, okay. I'm on slide five now. What patents are? So uh, – shit. I don't know how I can do this. Um, Let me try that. I want to give an example of a patent. The way it happens is you get a patent attorney or a patent agent, and, and a patent agent or a patent attorney is is either in, engineer or or an engineer with a law degree who has taken the patent bar exam and passed it. And if you're just an engineer, you're a patent agent, and if you're a patent, if you're an attorney, you're a patent attorney, and both both are qualified to file applications to the patent office. Um, uh, and I want to show an example of this because when I started practicing, I was totally confused because I only had one guy that was teaching me, and he wasn't a good teacher. Um, let me see here. Uh, I'm going to pull up an example here. So now let me share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see this patent application that I'm looking at right now? Or do I need to swap screen again or something? It's all clear. You can see it right now? Yes. Okay. I am on I'm on the top right now. I'm on page the very the very front page. Can everyone see this? The, the title says optical component holder. Anyone? No, we're looking at something that says IP treaties. Oh, hold on. The web browser. Maybe. How about now? What about now? Now we can see it. Okay. So this is um this is a patent application I drafted a few years ago. So it's so it's just a Word document and you you file it and you write it a certain way. And so it's got it starts with a title, you list the inventors, you explain the technical field, and then the background is like what's going before. So you set the stage. And then you have drawings, which I'll show in a second, and you have a description of the drawings. Then you have what's called the detailed description, and that's like required by patent law. In patent law, it's called the patent bargain. The bargain is the government is going to grant you a limited monopoly on the exclusive right to make, use, or sell, or import this claimed invention for 20 years from the filing date, which means about 17 or 18 years in practice because it takes about two or three years to get it issued from the date you file it. So if you file it on day one, you take two years to issue it. Then you have 18 years from the date of filing left. So you have an 18-year patent term. So it's about a 17, 18-year patent term typically. It used to be 17 by statute, but they changed it uh, years uh, under Obama. Uh, in any case, so th the bargain is we're going to give you this exclusive right in exchange for you disclosing to the world everything you know so that by the time it comes into the public domain in 18 years – Everyone knows what it is, and they know how to compete with you, and they know how to build on it and all that. So that, that's the patent bargain. That's why you have to have a written description, which number one has a written description of the invention. Number two has drawings, which, which illustrate it, and number three, uh, which enables someone skilled in the art to basically to do what you're, you're claiming, to, to, make, to make a copy of it eventually. So the detailed description starts here, and you refer to the figures, figure seven, whatever, with reference numerals. So I'm just scrolling through the patent. This is so this is what you write, okay? This is what you send into the patent office, okay? And then um, you have some drawings. I'm, I'm on the figures now here, and the drawings are figure one, whatever, and then with reference numerals pointing to different things, so you can refer to them in the description. Uh, and then you terminate the patent with a set of claims. Now, this is what you're claiming is the unique part that you you should get a property right in. This is sort of like the meets and bounds of your patent. So the claims start with a claim one, and they start with the word A or the always, um, 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 A or uh, or an. It's like um, a process, a machine, a device for whatever, comprising – comprising means including – and then you list the, the elements of the of, 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 of the essential nature of the invention. So this is an optical component holder comprising element A, element B, element C. 
are, are limited. They call these limitations too. In any case, that's what you get. A pro so if the examiner agrees with you that there's nothing similar out there in the in the prior art, then he'll grant you a patent. And that looks like um, this. Let me find that. Oh, by the way, so when you when you practice when you file the patent, the patent office keeps a record, and then going back and forth to the patent examiner is called. For some reason, I don't know why it's called prosecution. Probably just to confuse laymen. Uh, it's, it's not like um, a criminal case, but it's called prosecution. You're prosecuting the patent. You're trying to get it issued, and it's it's called um, it, it's not adverse. Like third parties are not part of this. This is all secret. It's only between the patent attorney of the uh, of the inventor or his court or his company's employer and the patent office. So it's like a one way proceeding. So there's all these obligations to be ethical and to be disclose everything. So this is a, a chronology. This is the patent office. Um, Prosecution history. So you see, it starts at the bottom. Like I file this on December 6, 2016, with the specification, the drawings, the claims, and the abstract. That's all part of the patent application as a power of attorney. And then there's all of the things. And then later on, um, you know, I get a, 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 a an office action from the examiner. He says, "I need you to change this in the claims." So then I'll have an amendment. You see, I file an amendment. And if it satisfies him, or I may, be, I, may be, I may disagree with him, I may argue with him. So this process goes on for a couple of years. You see, so finally the patent was issued, uh, or I got an issue notification in August of 2018, about two years later, saying, okay, it's going to issue in a couple of months if you pay the fee. And then that results in the issued patent, which is um, here, patent 10054762. So it shows kind of the features, the information I gave him in a format, you know, the title, the, the first inventor, the assignee, who's the owner. Uh, it shows my name as the attorney, Norman Kinsella. Uh, so it's got and then different classification fields for international filings. There's an abstract, which is like a summary and drawings and claims. Anyway, that's what a patent is. And by the way, up until I think two days ago, when the, the patent office apparently switched to a paperless some kind of electronic certificate uh, grant of patents. Uh, up until two days ago, um, you were issued a paper copy, and the the one original copy was called the red ribbon copy because it actually came with a red ribbon attached to the front cover. That's the picture of one right there. So it was like a gold foil embossed kind of seal with a red ribbon on it. So that's called a red ribbon copy. Oh, you don't really need that for anything. Uh, you can sue someone for a patent if you can prove you have one. Okay, let's get back to PowerPoint. Um, is the uh, red ribbon uh, copyrighted like the uh, seal? Is it copyrighted? What do you mean? Yeah, like you mentioned that the NSA label, you can't uh, replicate that. <laughs> I know, I don't think, no, I, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I mean that, it, that that might be a type of fraud or something if you did that, you know, in a certain in a certain way. Um, okay, I'm back on my slideshow. Can everyone see the, my slideshow? Yes. Okay. Now, there's something you should. So, when the patent is granted, then you have a property right, so to speak, in the in the claimed invention and. The, the first thing to look at is claim one. You have these, subs, these subsidiary claims like claim two, three, four. They're called dependent. So the first claim is always an independent claim. It stands by itself. You know, a device that does the following. Claim two is usually a dependent claim. It says you know, the invention of claim one having also A, B, and C. So you add some elements, and the reason you do that is because… Your first claim, you want it to be as broad as possible, but still be allowed by the examiner. Because if it's too broad, like if I just claimed um, an invention, period, then that would not be allowed because um, it's too broad because there's already inventions in the world. Or if I said I claim a machine, well, there's already machines in the world, so I can't get a patent on all the machines in the world because they're prior art. So I have to say a machine that has the following characteristics, which are new, right? which no one's done before. But if I add too many features that make it new, then it's easy for someone to just – like if I have 17 elements like A, B, C, D, all the way to, to K or whatever, someone can just copy my basic idea and just skip element K, and then they're not infringing my patent. 
so you want to have the minimum number of elements in the first claim that lets it get allowed. But in patent litigation later, it might get challenged because maybe the patent examiner who can only find so many references with a quick search because you're only paying a few thousand bucks to file it. So that only pays the examiner to do so much of a search. But in patent litigation, where millions of dollars on the line, the party you're suing for patent infringement might, might spend $100,000 on a search, and they might uncover some things the examiner didn't uncover. And that might show that patent one, claim one should not have been granted because it's too broad now. So what you do is you have claims two, three, four, five, and you add other elements to the other claims to so successively narrow them down so that if in litigation claim one gets invalidated because it was too broad, you can say, okay, well, fine. Claim one is too broad, but claim claim three is still uh, ha adds adds two more elements, and and the reference that you found doesn't have those. So claim three is still valid, and it's still broad enough to cover my competitor's products. So that's why people have all these claims in their patents. Um, it's a strategic practice. Um, now, the claim of a patent doesn't give you the right to do it. It gives you the right to exclude. That is, it gives you the right to stop people from doing it. Why doesn't it give you the right to do it? Um, the reason is because so, – so let me give an example. Let's suppose everyone sits on the ground, <laughs> and one day I come up with a stool. Now, a stool is a flat seat member having at least three legs depending from it, and you can sit on it. right? It makes sitting easier. So I, I, I file a patent application. I give a drawing, and I explain what a stool is, and I get a patent. I claim a seating, uh, I claim a seating uh, apparatus comprising – Called a stool, comprising a, a flat, a relatively flat seat member, attached to uh, uh, to three legs, spaced approximately triangularly apart. You know, having a length roughly equal to the half the length of a human, something like that. Right? You could claim a, a stool. Now, some other guy decides, hey, this stool would be way more useful if I put a back on it. Then it becomes a chair, right? So I take a stool, and I modify the stool, and I add a chair, and I patent that. So you could patent a chair. A, pat a, a chair would be a stool having a back seat member. Now, that's patentable because it's new and useful and non-obvious and all these things. Um, uh, but you can't make it because it's still a stool because it still meets the claims of the stool. It still has a seat and three legs. right? Even if it has four legs, it still has three legs. And so… I might invent an improvement on the stool called a chair, but I'm unable to make it and sell it. By the same token, the maker of the stool is unable to improve his stool by adding a back to it because that would violate the chair maker's patent. So what, what would happen is uh, quite often is this, the, the chair patent guy and the stool patent guy would, would do a license with each They would cross license to each other. Um, but the point is just because you have a patent doesn't give you the right to do something. It gives you the right to stop others. Now, that can be used strategically. To stop them from competing with you or to extort money from them if you're a patent troll, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, I'm on slide seven now. Um, now, there is one thing to keep in mind. I think I mentioned this on the previous slide. Uh, yeah, they're domestic only. Uh, I'm back on slide six. The uh, patent, Patents are domestic only. Now, if you think about it, all property rights are domestic. Like if you have a property right in your home in America… Or in Texas, then Texas law is what protects you. But by its nature, as a scarce material thing, it just doesn't make any sense that it's like it doesn't make a difference whether that right is national, state based, or international. Because if someone in China wanted to infringe my right to my house, they would have to go to Texas and try to break into my house, and they'd be covered by Texas law. So it's like there's no difference. It doesn't make any sense to distinguish between a, a property right being domestic or international because all property rights in scarce material real things, they only exist in one location at a time, and the legal system that covers that covers that. So they're the same thing in a sense. No one would give a thought to it. But for patents and copyrights, it's not it, – it, it makes a difference because there is no international patent or copyright system. There's only domestic law. But the way – because these things don't cover material things, and they cover copying, so theoretically, if I have a patent on an invention like, like say, the stool in America, um, 
it's national based. So no one in a, in the United States could make a stool without infringing my patent. They would be violating my my property right under U.S. law. But someone in Mexico or China or Russia or France who made a stool would they're not they're not violating the patent right because they're not doing it in America. They would only be violating my patent right if I filed a similar right, a patent in France or China or whatever, and they would be violating the Chinese patent. So when people accuse China of stealing American IP, they do, they literally don't know what they're talking about because it's literally impossible for a Chinese company or the Chinese government to infringe American patents by doing something in China. If if Apple has a patent on the on the iPhone. And if some Chinese company makes a complete pure knockoff of the iPhone in China, that literally is not an infringement of U.S. patent law, even by U.S. patent law's terms. It doesn't purport to cover things outside the U.S. Now, Apple probably would have a local patent in China, and the Chinese firm would be violating Chinese patents, and they have a Chinese patent system just like we have a U.S. patent system. Everyone acts like they don't have one, but of course they do because we've been successful in exporting our IP laws to other countries. So they do have – they would have a patent there, but it wouldn't be violating U.S. patents. I think what they usually mean when they say China is stealing U.S. IP – and say, by the way, the same thing is true for copyright. If if uh, if someone is selling a CD in China which has American songs on it, it's like it's not a violation of U.S. copyright. It might be a violation of Chinese copyright, but if they don't have a copyright or patent system, then it wouldn't be a violation of anything. Uh, you know, There was a time in the 1800s when some countries like Italy and the Netherlands uh, abolished or never had patent rights because they thought they were ridiculous. So companies were free to pirate other – not pirate, but to copy other companies' pharmaceuticals without any – without violating any law, any law whatsoever. I think what they're talking about is um, this. Remember, the types of IP include trademark, patent, copyright, and also trade secret. Um, and what happens is China doesn't have a free market um, like the U.S. does. Like in the U.S., it's more permissionless. You can just open up a company doing whatever you want. You don't have to ask for permission. But in China, it's more of a light. It's more of a socialistic bureaucratic system where you have to get permission to do things. You got to get a license from the local city or the local, the local region or the local province, and then the maybe the national government. So there's all these licenses and permissions you have to get. Like if you want to open up a an American company wants to open up a manufacturing facility in China, you got to get all these permissions. So what happened because they don't have a free market, you got to get permission. And when you get permission, the government can use that to extract promises from you. Like you got a promise to hire so many people locally, um, and you have to partner with a local firm here so we can claim that we're promoting local business. That's called a joint venture. So quite often, if Apple wants to open a manufacturing facility, they have to use a local Chinese company or they have to open their own facility and partner with a local company. Now, that's the price of doing business. Now, if you don't want to open a facility in China to save money, you don't have to, but if you want to, you have to… Uh, do what you have to do to get the license, and that might mean partnering with some locals. And when you look, when you partner with locals and you hire locals, guess what's going to happen? Same thing that happens in America. You have employees that sometimes steal the you know they violate their non disclosure agreements and their employment agreements or their joint 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 venture agreements, and they they leak the information that's supposed to be proprietary. This is trade secret information. So if Apple's building a new iPhone, you know, some employee might take a photograph of it when they're on the assembly line and sell it to one of their buddies, and then soon you have a uh, you have a a knockoff company making, you know, making a making a, a version of that of that good, and that is you could say this is a violation of trade secret law, but it's a, but it's it's what it's what's going to happen when you have employees, and it's good it's what's going to happen when you have. A joint venture with a Chinese company, which you agreed to do to get the benefit of doing business there. It's got nothing to do with patent or copyright because if that design would, was patented under Chinese patent law, then you, of course, Apple could sue the the knockoff company in Chinese courts, just like they can sue people in America for knockoff. So, this thing about China stealing U.S. IP is complete nonsense. Um, in any case, the heart of the patent. For purposes of getting the patent, it's the description I mentioned earlier, the detailed description, the drawings, and the description explaining how it works. That's what you have to do to get the patent. You got to, you know, lower your panties and show things to the world. But the heart of the patent, from a legal point of view, is the claims because the claims are what your property rights are in. And again, as I mentioned earlier, patents are the right to exclude, not the right to practice.
with the stool and chair example. Okay, now on seven, I've got a post to explain. It's just incredible all the legislation that's out there um, covering patent and IP law. Uh, it's just a morass. That's why you need specialists like me um, to decipher it for you because no one can understand this. But there are, as I said, patents are domestic, but there are international aspects to patents. But those are primarily the following three or four treaties. Number one, the Paris Convention from 1883. So that allows you to file in one country, like in the US, and then within a year, you could file um, in other countries. So I could file on day one in the US and say six months later, I could file a UK patent and a Chinese patent um, and a Russia patent or whatever claiming the priority date of the U.S. filing. And then the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which came about about a century later in 1970, uh, is more – it's like the Paris Convention, but it's more unified. So you, you could just file a PCT application. So so let's say I file in the U.S. on day one, and it costs, let's say, ten twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to pay the patent attorneys and the filing fees and all that. Now, let's say a good – one third or one fourth of the patents that you file, if you're a large company, are eventually going to be either unimportant because you don't make the product that you were planning to make that the patent it covers, or because the patent office rejects the patent and you never get it. So if you were to file a hundred or or twenty patent applications in different countries, you're talking that ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars multiplied by, you know. 10 or 20 or 30 times. It could be millions of dollars to file in every – so most most patents, you only file them in one country or in the crucial countries like America, Europe, the European Patent uh, Treaty, China maybe. Um, but even then, what you might do is you might file one patent application in the US, and then six months later, you file – or three months later, you file a PCT application, and that gives you like uh, two and a half years to wait to decide whether to file in another country. So then you have time to to decide financially whether it's worth it. Anyway, it's just a thing people do. Um, and then there's the uh, the trips aspects of the WTO agreement, and this is what sets down minimum standards. Like, so if you want to be part of the WTO, your patent law, although it's domestic, it only covers your country, but it has to have certain minimum standards. Like, it can't be two years. You need to be at least X years. I don't know what it is, but most countries are about 17, 18 years, like I said. So um, you have to have certain minimum standards. Um, this is how the U.S. pushes um, and, and Western countries push our IP laws on other countries with these agreements and also other agreements. I'm going to go to the next slide now, slide eight, uh, like uh, um, bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements. We sneak into those things like, oh, if you want a free trade agreement with the U.S., you need to expand. You need to increase the length of your copyright term by 20 years to be more like us. Canada actually did that recently, just hoping to join a treaty that never got never got passed. Um, so, uh, I call this IP imperialism, and I've got some blog posts about that. Um, um, okay, so. So. Most countries in the world, including communist countries like Cuba and North Korea and China and Russia, Soviet Union, they all had patent laws. It's not like a capitalist Western thing. In fact, I would argue IP is socialistic because it's, a, it's institutionalized interference with private property rights, as I argue in my policy talks about why patent laws should be abolished. Um, so I think actually IP is a socialist policy, but anyway, most people view it as… A capitalist Western thing because the word property is in there because of the dishonest uh, nomenclature used by the by the uh, by the patent whores um, to call it IP rights. So people think it's a property rights thing, so they think it's the Western thing. So they are actually surprised when it's it's uh, they they find out that Cuba and North Korea and Russia and Soviet Union, uh, everyone Vietnam they they all had they all had patent law and copyright law. Um, okay. Now, as I said earlier, so so to get a patent, you have to give a disclosure and all this, but patents, what what do they cover? I already said what they are. They are an exclusive right to practice an invention, but that means the subject matter of patents is inventions, right? So trademarks cover like trade names, like things that identify the source of goods. Trade secrets is proprietary information that's useful to you if, as long as it's kept secret, that you keep something you keep secret. Uh, copyrights have to do with um, original 
creative works like novels or paintings or movies or you know, things like that. Um, uh, patents cover inventions, which are which are practical processes or apparatuses or devices that can do something useful. So to get a patent, you have to satisfy, say, four basic criteria. This is according to the Patent Act in the US and the similar in other countries. So number one, you have to have statutory subject matter, which means it's an invention. So you can't get abstract ideas like e equals mc squared or math or physics theorems, even though those are useful too. They're too they're too much part of the universe or something like that. And you can't get a patent for for artistic works. You know that's what copyright covers. Um, I think there was one interesting case where someone was selling a measuring cup where it was like a half of a cup, but it looked like a cup measuring cup, and all the lines in there would say like a half a cup halfway down, but it was for half a cup. So like if you wanted to have your measurements, you could just take a cup. Like if the recipe said a half a cup. But you wanted to make half the recipe, you could use the half a cup cup thing and go to half a cup. And like, if you were too stupid with with math or algebra, I don't know. Um, and so there was a there was the question was well, you can't get a patent on this because it's it's about it's about a writing, and that's what copyrights cover. But the, I think the the court said no, no, this is actually functional because it helps you solve a problem. Anyway, you have to have statutory subject matter, which is usually easy to satisfy. Um, it has to be useful. You have utility. Uh, and that's usually easy to satisfy too because most inventions, uh, the examiner just assumes that it, that it works. Um, by the way, you don't have to make a working model anymore. To You just have to file a piece of paper describing the invention. That's called a constructive reduction to practice. A reduction to practice would be actually making a working model. Now, the patent office used to require a working model, and they still have the option to ask you to turn one in if they're not clear about how – whether it works. But – I've never made one in my life. Usually you can brainstorm with an engineer in a, in a room, a conference room, in 15 minutes you can say it would be neat if you could just move the resistor over here, and that would that would make room, room for this, and that would make a better device. And you could just describe that and file a patent on it, and the day you file it with the patent office, that is called constructive reduction to practice. It's like a fiction um, in any case. If you file something that seems like a perpetual motion machine… Like Joseph Newman did, these the, he had some kind of idea for using magnets or something to like magnetic particles to have a, a machine that can generate electricity for free. He never could make it work because perpetual motion is actually impossible. So if the examiner can detect that there's perpetual motion being claimed in your invention, he will reject it for not having utility. Um, and then also, like if you if if you made a device, the only purpose of which would be to like to destroy humanity or something. That would be claimed to have disutility, not utility, so you couldn't get a patent on that either. I've never had these problems in my practice making lasers and things. Um, the two big requirements are your invention has to be new or novel, uh, which means no one's done it before. And it's also got – and the most difficult step in the final one, it's got to be non-obvious in view of what was known before. Or, or, or you have to have what's called an inventive step. That's what they say in Europe. Now, this one is arbitrary, and so basically the examiner, he finds one or two or more prior art references which are not exactly on point. If they were exactly on point, then your invention wouldn't be new. But it's you, you can always usually change something. Like let's say someone had invented, a, I don't know, a red automobile, and I've just made a blue automobile. Well, then my blue automobile would be new, but it would still be obvious in view of the fact that automobiles were known already. Because it would be obvious to just change the paint color. That's how they argue. Anyway, that last step is the one patent lawyers usually end up arguing with the patent office most on. Um, and there's all kinds of legal standards which have evolved over the years about the nuances of this. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, the patent application process is done by a patent attorney or a patent agent, usually patent attorneys. Um, <clears throat> what you do is you talk to the engineer, usually an employee at a company. And on the phone or in person, and and you try to have him explain to you his idea, and you ask him questions, and you then you write a draft of the patent application like I showed you earlier, and you file it. Um, now, one interesting thing about the process is in most countries – I know in the US, but in most countries, I believe you have to file in the country it's invented in first because most countries have these – export licenses and all these things to control potential secrets and all this kind of stuff. So before I – if I file a patent application in the US, I cannot file in any other country, Canada, Europe, 
PCT, uh, I'm sorry, not PCT, but uh, um, China, whatever. I can't file in the other country until the U.S. government gives me permission. That's called a foreign filing license. So when you file a patent in the U.S., about two or three months later, you automatically usually get a letter back from the patent office saying – your foreign filing license is hereby granted. Like they kind of give it a cursory review, make sure there's no nuclear stuff in there or whatever, and uh, that they want to claim for themselves. And then, then you have the right to file in the piece you know, overseas and other countries, whatever. Alternatively, you could file a foreign file, filing license first, which I have never done in my whole career. And then you could file in another country first if you wanted to, but you have to get the foreign filing license first. Um, and on occasion, which again, it's never happened to me, but theoretically, instead of giving you the foreign filing license after you file a US patent, you might get a notice from the, from some secret government agent, some government agency saying, we detect national important secrets in here, so we're going to give you a secrecy order, and we're going to basically expropriate this patent from you. They might pay you some kind of expropriation fee or something. I don't know. I've never had it happen. But the thing is they have a chance to take a first look at it, and if you had a patent where um, there was something that – like the NSA or the military thought they could use, they might want to keep you from making it public to the world because when you file your patent, it's not made public. Uh, until 18 months later. So there is still secret until 18 months later, roughly, when it's published. Okay. And this is getting into the details, but again, you could file in the US, you could use the PCT application to preserve foreign filing rights, or you can use the Paris Convention. Anyway, and this process, again, as I mentioned, is called patent prosecution. It usually takes I've had them I've had them take eight months to a year on rare occasions, but usually two. Usually two to three years is what it takes, and sometimes way longer, but usually two to three years. So if you have 20-year term from the date of filing, patents usually last 18 to 17 years. That's roughly how it works um, ever since the – about 15 years ago when the law was changed. Now, once you have a patent, and most companies have patents because they get them because their employees have an obligation under – default state employment law or under their or under the agreement that they sign when they when they join the company basically anything an employee especially an engineer or a technical person where part of their job is to come up with technical solutions to things um and to innovate basically when when the when the employee comes up with the invention it's automatically owned by the employer so most of your work as a patent attorney is going to be representing companies who have employers I'm sorry, employees, usually engineers, who come up with inventions and you file patents on them. Now, the company might pay a bonus to the inventor. They don't have to, but they you know, give them $1,000, $5,000 as a bonus to incentivize them to come up with these patents because they're, they can be valuable to the company. And usually companies strategically develop a patent portfolio. Now, why do they do this? They do this for different reasons. Most of the time, it's not the in, the the independent inventor working out of his garage who makes in, intermittent windshield wipers and makes millions of dollars. You know, usually it's the employee of a corporation, right? That's what happens. Uh, usually, a large corporation, um, because it's expensive to file these patents and it's very expensive to to assert them in litigation. Um, so, one reason is defensive. Like you basically you want a cluster of patents surrounding your technology. To dissuade your competitors from suing you for infringing their patents because you want to make them afraid to sue you because if someone sues me, like if I'm competing with another company, I'm making I'm making cell phones, they're making cell phones. Um, I might accidentally or on purpose infringe some of their patents because uh, patents are largely bullshit. And <laughs> it's almost impossible to avoid infringing patents. So if I'm making my cell phones, even though I'm covered with a bunch of patents, as, as, as I said earlier, patents don't give you the right to do anything, only to stop other people. So just because I have 50 patents covering my cell phone technology doesn't mean I have the right to do it. I might still be infringing someone else's patents. So I come out with my first product, and all of a sudden I get sued by my competitor. Well, my competitor might be afraid to sue me if I have 50 patents because – they're, if they're also making cell phones, they may be infringing one of my patents, and I could counter sue them. So one main reason to have patents is defensive. It's like the porcupine approach. Like you don't sue me, and I won't sue you. Of course, this leads to oligopolies and cartels because only the large companies can afford to have these big patent portfolios. So this makes the little guys afraid to enter the fray because they can't they can't defend themselves with their patents. So they're they're at the mercy of all the big companies that have all the patents. Uh, another re reason is to raise capital. Like if you're if you're a startup and you want you have venture capital and you want to impress your investors, they're going to ask you, do you have a good patent program? 
and you can say, oh, yeah, we have 50 patents covering our product. They'll say, okay, you're protected. Uh, another, another way, another reason to have these patents is to make money by licensing them. This is what patent trolls do, by the way. Patent trolls just run around. Um, they get patents. They either buy them from, from bankrupt companies or they just have brainstorming sessions with a bunch of engineers. They file a bunch of patents. They get a bunch of patents, and they just run around suing people. Uh, as I mentioned on the slide on page 11, slide 11, um, you know, they don't really want to kill the people they're suing. They just want to wet their beaks like, like a mafia guy, you know, uh, as, as, as pro IP objectivist law professor Adam Mossov says, uh, oh, lawsuits like this are just an invitation to negotiation. I'm serious about this. You need to speak to me. <laughs> like he says that like it's a good thing. It's a freaking mafia type threat. Um, and and some some large companies do this too. Like IBM for years has made like I think uh, since ninety six to twenty twenty one they made twenty seven billion dollars licensing their huge trove of patents to people. Of course, behind this license is the threat of loss. Like if you don't give me some money, I'm going to sue you. So it's all extortion. I think in recent years it's gone down from like a billion a year. It's like six hundred million dollars a year they've been making in recent years. So big money can be had by licensing the patents. Uh, and then again, by patent litigation or uh, like patent trolls can do it. And then I'm on slide 12 now. Uh, and uh, patent trolls are are disparagingly referred to as non practicing entities. And everyone's critical of patent trolls. They're like, well, they're not even making the product. It's like, yeah, but that means they don't want to kill you. They just want to taste. <laughs> they're just a tax. If, I, if, if, if I'm making smartphones and a patent troll comes after me, they just want to take a little cut of my profits so I can pay that just like I pay my taxes. And I can keep practicing. But if my competitor sues me, they want to kill me. They want to stop me. They don't want me to compete with them. They don't want to cut. They want to stop me. So actually, so-called practicing entities are worse than patent trolls. If all we had to worry about was patent trolls, we would just write patents off as a, as a little drag on innovation, a cost. It wouldn't be the death knell that actual practicing entities do. So like you know, uh, some of you might remember um, – Apple had a patent, a design patent, not even a utility patent, which is a, pat a patent on an invention. Design patent, just the way something looks, basically the ornamental aspects. And patent had a Apple had a patent on basically like a flat touchscreen device, like an iPad or an or an iPhone with rounded corners. <laughs> and so they sued uh, Motorola, and then there was all these smartphone wars about 10, 15 years ago between uh, Samsung and Motorola and Apple. Um, and of course, what they did was they had they they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on patent patent attorneys doing the litigation, um, and then they finally settled with each, with each other with like cross licenses, and someone agreed to pay a royalty to the other. And all they did was they passed the cost down to the consumers in the in the in the form of higher higher phone prices, and they basically end up forming a cartel. Like you have these major phone companies, which all have big patent troves, like. Samsung and Motorola and Google and and, and Apple, and a, if you were a startup company, you wanted to make you know Stephen Casella's new smartphone. I might have one or two patents, but I'm going to be sued into oblivion by all these big guys if I try to make a smartphone because there's no doubt they're going to find some of their patents. They're going to say I I violate, and even if I'm right, and I have to go to court, it's going to cost me literally millions of dollars to defend myself. And if I win, I just walk away with a loss of money and the right to practice. So this basically is a way of dissuading small companies from getting into the business, and that creates large companies. So it creates oligopolies and cartels. All right. I think I'm done with my lectures. Uh, let me turn this off then. Um, Probably have some questions remaining, so I will open the floor to any questions. And although I said this is about IP law, not policy, uh, you can ask whatever you want because they all go together. So uh, everyone, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Uh, oh, are you familiar with the uh, Wright brothers being uh, patent trolls? Yeah, vaguely. I think uh, Bolger and Levine cover some of that in their book uh, Against Intellectual Monopoly, and um, – yeah, of course. A lot of these early innovative industries um, were embroiled in litigation. It distracted them from their original focus. And if I remember, I don't remember the facts exactly, but um, there were so many lawsuits and there was so much uh, damage to the to the fledgling airline aviation industry in the U.S., which you know basically started here with the Wright brothers. 
but uh, that was the late 1800s. So by the time World War I broke out, when airline, airplanes were starting to be useful for, for warfare, uh, the entire um, uh, American um, uh, aviation industry was like decimated because of these stupid patent wars. So I believe the original airplanes had to be – they had to go to France to get them or something. Finally, there was some kind of government-mediated settlement, and then the U.S. industry started up again. But it, but this is an example of how patent battles can can delay technological innovation for uh, for, for a generation. Uh, there was there was a type of television technology about 12 years ago. Um, uh, I forgot the name of it. It was, it was like before OLED, but it was some kind of unique. It was after plasma, and it was this unique, really promising technology. Uh, but there were so many patent wars that all the manufacturers just gave up. They couldn't make it because there was too many threats, and they they had moved on, moved on to the next thing. Maybe the next thing would have been better, but we'll never know because they just didn't. They weren't able to do it. Yeah, I always hear like uh, about the White Brothers invention and Kitty Hawk in the museum, and you only hear about the plane, but you never hear about what they did with the rest of their lives afterwards, and they just became patent trolls. Yeah, and, um, and Edison with the light bulb, all these, all these guys, they, you know, they tried to exploit the patent system. Again, this is why the patent system came under attack. Uh, one, one interesting thing was so in you know, like I said, it was sort of a remnant of the statute of monopolies in 1623. And then the U.S. kind of passed the first major modern patent act in 1790, um, and about you know 30 years later in the eight, mid 1800s, all the free market economists started saying, "What the hell? What, what are we doing?" So they were really pro free trade, and they they could they they made a clear argument that patent rights impede free trade. So all these countries started going, yeah. So there was like a strong movement in the mid 1800s to abolish patent law, and it was started it started working. Some countries abolished their patent law, others refused to implement it, and it looked like it might have been on its way to being phased out because it was just like a remnant of the protectionist mercantilist era of previous centuries. <clears throat> but then what happened was in around 1873, there was a major world recession, and um, and when that happened. Everyone got really paranoid, and they started being hostile to free trade. And so mm -hmm. because everyone was hostile to free trade, they stopped listening to the economists who said patents are a bad idea because they're contrary to free trade. And so this patent abolition movement just collapsed, and patents had their – were able to survive and prosper, and then they got so entrenched because all the inventors like Edison and, 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 and the Wright brothers, these kind of guys… They're like, you can't take away our patent system. We need this to, for, you know, so, so it got entrenched. And now we have today's situation where everyone, uh, everyone just assumes patents are a natural part of, of, of any private property system. Do you have a citation on uh, that historical movement, the free market economists in the 19th century going yeah, against? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, probably the uh, a good Eventually. source on that is, um, um, there's there's kind of a quasi – he's either Austrian or quasi-Austrian. There's an economist called Fritz Machlup, M-A-C-H-L-U-P, um, and in 1950, I believe, he and Edith Penrose – it's on my website, c4saf.org. Um, he and Edith Penrose wrote, a, wrote an article about the 19th century patent law movement and, and why it collapsed. That's a really good article. I think Machlup summarizes it. Um, Later, in a 1958 study he wrote for Congress on the patent system as a whole, which is also on my website, c4sif.org. So look for Fritz Macklup and Edith Penrose, something called the 19th century patent movement or something like that. Thank you, Stephen. That's an awesome source. Appreciate it. Uh, could somebody uh, – you mentioned like some of, some of these people had to go to France to kind of uh, escape uh, the harsh – patent regulations here in the 1800s and sometimes they go to china could uh somebody <clears throat> make like a avoid all that uh build an, an oil rig uh like structure out in the ocean international waters and avoid infringing on anyone and build what they want without being sued or um prevented well probably they could build it out there although you know th there's dangers of flying without a flag right and being um, being out in the open, uh, but the problem is that what you, you, the patent right covers making, using, selling, or importing a product, and so 
if you made a bunch of knockoff iPhones on this uh, oil rig in, in, in international waters, what are you going to do with them? If you want to sell them in any country, like you sell them in the, in the U.S., you'd still be violating the U.S. patents because you're selling them there or importing them there. And, and all the customers would be violating the using part. They'd be using it, so it, you'd still be you still be covered. I mean, the only thing you could do is make them. So so let's let's say you're at, even Apple is probably not going to patent the iPhone in every country in the world because it's just too expensive. All you need to do is patent it in the countries, the biggest markets like Europe and say America, or the or the countries where it's likely to be made, like say China. Because if you have that covered, you have the endpoints. And the start points covered. Now, maybe you know, maybe uh, maybe Liechtenstein. <laughs> maybe you could make them in Liechtenstein to sell them to Liechtensteinians because they're not going to have a patent in Liechtenstein. <laughs> but you know, the market is too trivial for that. Is uh, Liechtenstein the uh, patentless uh, paradise? Uh... No, it's, it's just that it's a small country, and you probably, like I said, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a, a patent in 193 hundred countries. You'd have it in the top X countries. So the, the small countries, would you would not have a patent in the small countries. Mm. Anyone else? Do you have your own patents? Um, I filed a couple on my own, and I was a co-inventor on a couple. When you're a patent attorney and you talk to the inventors, usually you're not a an inventor, but on occasion you come up with a suggestion when you're brainstorming with them, and if it's if it's sufficient to make you a, a co-inventor of of one of the claims, then you're listed. So I'm listed on on three or four patents. What about uh, patenting uh, computer code? So, so that's interesting because so let's say go back forty years. Uh, Software and computer code was not considered to be covered by copyright or by patents. Okay, but over time, um, now computer code can be patented and is copyrighted. So it's copyrighted because it's considered to be a writing, a work of authorship. Um, you know, just if I write a novel, it's patented. I'm mean, sorry, it's copyrighted. If I if I write computer code. It's still something I wrote. Now, some people disagree with that because they say computer code is functional; it's not really expressive. But then, you know, you have your software autistic savant say, "Oh no, it's really an art, man. We're expressing ourselves." <laughs> There's comments in the code, <laughs> so copyright covers it now. But, but copyright only covers the the actual expression of it; it doesn't cover the functionality. So mm -hmm. if 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 I if I copy if I have a copyright in my code for um um a spreadsheet program or something. If someone gets that code, and, and remember in the old days, they wouldn't release the code. They would just release the executable. They would keep the code proprietary. Mm. But mm -hmm. you could theoretically reverse engineer the code, the executable, or you could maybe get a, a, a pirated copy of, of the actual code. And th so now you know the functionality. If you just write your own code from scratch, that would mm -hmm. not violate the copyright. Mm -hmm. However, you can also, because patents allow you to, there, there are there. Are, I think there are four types of patents. There's utility patents, which is the patent everyone thinks of, which is um, which is the useful uh, process or apparatus. Mm -hmm. uh, there's composition patents, which is like for pharmaceuticals, and there's also design patents, which is the ornamental way something looks, like the iPhone rounded corners thing. And then there's mm -hmm. also plant patents, which is for asexually reproduced plants. And those are kind of special domains. I don't really do those, and they have different terms. But the regular patent everyone thinks about is a design, is a utility patent. And again, that covers a process and an apparatus. An mm -hmm. apparatus is a machine or a device, but mm -hmm. a process is just a flowchart. So it's a way of doing things, and that's what so <laughs> and that's what software is. Software is a it's a process. So if you if you mm -hmm. can take the code not in the seven hundred page or the, the seventy page detailed level, but you can break it down into a flowchart with boxes and arrows. That gets to be more of a functional thing, and you can – if you can describe that in a series of steps in a patent claim, like I claim um, – I claim a process for uh, – a process for uh, for detecting an image mm -hmm. or, or a process for compressing data comprising the following steps. Step one, uh, receiving input, input data of an image number, of a sequence of moving images. Step two. Uh, uh, de determining the difference between 
frame one and frame two. And step three, instead of transmitting frame two, transmitting frame one and then the differences because the differences are smaller than the, you know, that's what image compression is, right? And so I've done mm -hmm. patents on this kind of stuff for Intel and other companies like that. So that would effectively cover the functionality of software code, which means someone couldn't even reverse engineer and write it their own way because if they're still doing the basically flowchart under a different language, they're still infringing the patent. But mm -hmm. you have to apply for a patent. Copyrights are automatic, which means they're more mm -hmm. problematic for software. For patents, you have to apply for it, uh, and then people know what it is too, like because it's published mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. And then you know, if you write a program in JavaScript, for example, you're using a computer language that was made by another private organization, and they seem to uh, permit people to use it to do what they want, but like it is something owned and controlled by some other organization you create your own program that does something new. I mean, it seems like you could never disentangle who originated what, you know. Um, I, I think I, I'm, and I specialize more in patents than in, in software and copyright. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, well, first of all, a lot of these things are open source. So you just don't have that problem because no one's mm. even trying to. The open source, the most that they try to do is they try to say, you can use our code to build your code, but we do have a copyright in our code, but we're going to let you use it, and the only condition is we're going to insist that if you make a new uh, software incorporating some of our stuff, which under copyright law might be called a derivative work, um, then you have a copyright in that yourself, but we're going to insist that you grant the same license to everyone else. It's, it's called the – I think it's called the uh, – it's like a copyleft kind of thing, or in CC, it would be mm. the CC, CCSA, share alike. I think mm -hmm. GNU. I think GNU does that. So they they basically try to force you into using their model, which is copy left. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the same thing as using someone's software engine to generate your code. Mm -hmm. So if if I licensed, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not up to date on current how people do it. When I when I was in college, I would use like Pascal or C plus plus. Okay, so I go to Turbo Pascal and I I, I buy this software. And I can use their format to write a to write a program and to generate an executable, right? Um, so I'm using their copyrighted or their their copyrighted software to do something. Now, theoretically, they could have an in, end user license agreement. If they don't have if they don't have a license agreement, then I, what I create is just mine, mine alone. The fact that I'm using their tools doesn't make it theirs. Hmm. You know, so it's like if I rent your your machine shop to make to make to make my my new gear. I own that gear, and I own any patent mm. in that gear. Just because mm -hmm. I'm using their materials doesn't mean anything. Uh, but if they had an agreement with me, if they, if they could, ex they could basically say, "We're only going to sell you this software if you sign on the dotted line, and you agree that anything you make with our with our tool, we own part of." I suppose that might be enforceable. I've never heard of that because that would be just too unpopular in the market. Mm. Um, I think I would just go use a pirated copy of Turbo Pascal or whatever <laughs> instead of using theirs because I wouldn't want the inventions I come up with to be their property. I don't think that's a problem, hmm. but I could I could be wrong. Okay. Someone who's more of an expert in software would know, but I don't think that the companies that make the software tools you use to generate your your, your thing, unless it includes some of their libraries, and then they could say – they could use this copyleft thing. So if you incorporate our libraries, you have to give us credit or attribution or you have to – release yours under some kind of license, but I don't, I don't know in practice how restrictive they are. Mm -hmm. I, th I think with software encoding is that it's, uh, uh, there's always a next upgrade and next uh, update every week. Uh, it's always uh, changing. Uh, I think it makes it impossible to try to uh, nab it and try to patent it right away when the next week is just going to be a different version and that makes it the, the present one obsolete, like, uh, like fashion. I think uh, it's difficult to copyright fashion, I think be in the same room that's correct and there's an interesting thing so fashion is not in perfect like perfumes all the smells of perfume they're not protected either um uh, so fashion designs are not protected by any kind of special right so that's why you have these knockoffs like you'll have these high-end luxury you know couture manufacturers chanel and dior and all these they come up with these things are five thousand dollar dresses or whatever and then you'll see a very similar thing the next season in walmart you know um so, but but what what happens is like because there's no copyright or patent um, 
on fashion designs, you have you have some uh, some of these high end brands they try to use trademark. So this is why, for example, you've probably seen uh, like Chanel purses. They have the big Chanel C on it, right? The double C thing, or you, Louis Vuitton. They have that little Louis Vuitton little clover symbol with LV all over their luggage and their purses. And the reason they do that is because if someone makes a knockoff of a Louis Vuitton handbag, they have to copy that design of, of their logo, and that might be covered by trademark or even copyright. So what they've done is they they basically embedded into their product their trademarked logo, and they forced consumers to think that's part of a fashion design of it. It, it would be like if you bought a Mercedes and like the entire Mercedes car. It was covered with thousands of little – their little triangular circle logo thing like all over the car. <laughs> like that was part of the essence of the car is that you had a thousand Mercedes logos painted on it. So then if someone wanted to make a knockoff Mercedes car, they'd have to make it look like a Mercedes by having the Mercedes logo, and that violate their trademark. So in a way, this weird uh, lack of and availability of trademark law but lack of copyright law for fashion has distorted – I don't I I can't I don't know if we would have had this 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 phenomena of of purses and dresses and handbags and luggage having the logos plastered all over them as part of the of the design if it wasn't for people trying what they could to use some type of IP law to protect themselves from competition. If there was no patent and copyright and trademark law, maybe this never would have happened. We'd have a whole different fashion industry. What is your position on copyleft? Well, <clears throat> I don't like it at all, um, and I think if there was no copyright, it would disappear because copyleft depends upon there being copyright. Like copyleft says, I have a copyright in this, and I only I'm, I have the right to stop you from using my copyrighted uh, material. I'm going to let you use it, but only under these conditions. So it's a license, and a license is permission, but people only need permission if they need permission. They only need permission if someone has a copyright and they can stop you. If there was no copyright, you wouldn't need permission to copy people's things, so copyleft would disappear. I prefer CC0 or CCBY, attribution only or zero. Um, I, I don't see how CCBY is, is any big imposition because most people, when they copy your novel or your painting, the, if they're not going to be in legal trouble for doing it, they don't have a problem saying who the original author was. They don't usually… Copy a novel and change the name of the author and pretend like they're the author because they would look like an idiot, right? <laughs> so most people, if if you if you do a bootleg copy of I don't know the latest Avatar movie by James Cameron, you're not going to pretend it wasn't James Cameron. So the CC BY condition is not an imposition because everyone's going. No one has a problem with attribution giving attribution if 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 doing so doesn't make them liable. Um, but CC CC B, CC left copyright under CC it's called share alike and. Uh, copy left is what you're talking about, that version of it. I don't like it because it's an attempt to use my little activist thing and to leverage my copyrights to force you to do it my way. Um, I, I prefer to open it up, just make it open source. So for example, if I published if I published a, a novel and I released a CC0, that means anyone in the world is free to Reprint it even with their name on it, or they can make a movie based on it. Now, let's let's say I publish a novel and someone makes a movie based on it. They would actually have a copyright in that movie because it's a derivative work, but I don't have any rights in it because I've disclaimed my copyright in my book. So they would have a pure, brand new copyright in their movie, and they could they could use copyright against people, which I don't like. But I don't think it's my against your book as well. No, not against my book, but uh, but against. Because my book is not a derivative work of their novel; it's the other way around. I mean, of their movie. Their movie is a derivative work of my book, but they could they could stop me from copying the novel, the movie. Sorry, like even if I copied the movie, I'd be in trouble because it's a it's a unique new work on its own. It's a derivative work. But if I used copy left, then they they would only be able to have the right to make this movie if they also released it under copy left, which means they couldn't sue people. And I can understand the motivation to do that. It's sort of an activist thing. It's trying to use your copyright to force other people to be libertarian. I I prefer to just open it up and make it non-copyright. That's my preference. Okay, thanks. So, what uh, what do you think about like just 
breaking those uh, licenses, like creating a darknet website with uh, software, which uh, or movies or whatever, just breaking it and doing it illegally. Well, I don't know if it's it's prudent or wise in every case because there are severe criminal copyright penalties. Um, you, I mean, people can actually go to prison for this kind of stuff. Um, unfortunately, I mean, it dark net like without any trace, like without uh, any way to government to trace yeah. who, who did it. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm all in favor of that. I think copyright law is totally evil, and and so is patent law, and I think evading it is perfectly perfectly moral and a good thing to do if you can get away with it i don't know if it's always risk it, it worth the risk um um but i think it's a good thing in fact i think this is this is part of the problem with copyright is that um it can be evaded by as you say with the dark net or with encryption or with um torrenting and things like that in a sense the internet is the biggest threat to Digit the digitalization of, of, of information and the internet, uh, streaming, torrenting, encryption is a huge threat to copyright because basically it's it's it has become now impossible to stop what they call piracy, which is which is a misnomer, but it's 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 impossible to stop piracy, um, uh, and this is why governments keep trying to pass laws that effectively restrict internet freedom. Which is why I think copyright is, in a way, the most. Um, well, I have a debate about whether copyright or patent law is more harmful. I think patent law is more harmful than copyright in that patents slow down the pace of new innovation, and this is how the human race became as wealthy as it as it is by the accumulation of technological knowledge. And if you slow it down, you're sl you're slowing down the advancement of the human race. On the other hand, copyright law lasts a lot longer, and it, it heavily distorts culture, and it's also a threat to internet freedom because the, the copyright interests know that the internet is a big threat to their copyright enforcement regime. So they keep trying to uh, to ch like get rid of the DMCA, uh, the, the, uh, the 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 safe harbor and the, the DMCA. They hate that, you know. They want to be able to sue like YouTube and Google and blogs and platforms for hosting infringing content instead of having to go after the guy that did it um, and issue a takedown notice and all this kind of stuff. They hate this stuff. Um, and But of course, the internet would probably disappear if copyright was enforced um, the way it was intended to. Uh, so th th this is one of the problems with copyright. It's a threat to internet freedom and internet. The internet is essential to fighting the state. Um, you know, I, I'm afraid that this new AI that's coming out could be killed by copyright because you you already have people calling Barry Diller and other people calling for um, saying that you know when you have these AI engines like ChatGPT and the other one that does the, the art or whatever they basically mine the internet for images and, and for data right to train on and to build on and then they generate a new output so it's basically a black box that transforms information online into an output now from a copyright point of view most of that information they're they're downloading is is probably protected by copyright, and then what they're generating is, would be a derivative work, and that's technically a copyright infringement. And since there's, these AIs do so many trillions of operations internally, and they operate so much faster than us, um, like there's one study by a law professor named John Taranian about 12 years ago, and he estimated that like everyone, everyone here on this call, everyone that's a, a normal, modern internet user. Theoretically, is is liable for about four point five billion dollars a year in damages for copyright infringement just from copying things on the internet, sending someone an email here and there, that kind of stuff. Now, imagine ChatGPT. So take the four point five billion, and that was twelve years ago. So let, let's say six billion now. Take the six billion we're all liable for every year, which is preposterous, but that's the way copyright law works. Um, and multiply that times, I don't know. A billion or a trillion, all the operations these 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 AIs use. So, like you know, every AI is liable for quintillion dollars a year in damages, which is a thousand times more than the entire planet Earth is worth. It's like insane, right? It's this is how this is what you get. It's it's like the legal equivalent of dividing by zero. Like in math, if you divide by zero, you get you get uh, impossible, irrational results.
And in law, when you try to protect intangible things with physical force, which is a tangible thing, you're dividing by zero, and you get insane shit like this. But they combine it, co uh, combine it with censorship, so it's kind of working uh, like violation uh, uh, intellectual property, but also in in the way that it's not good for people it's good for corporations well sure that that gets that gets us uh, to uh, you know the topic of ai itself and whether in its current form it can be useful as it's kind of quasi controlled by the state i, I mean i i'm personally not i i'm a skeptic of ai and its utility but i think it's going to keep developing and eventually it might turn into something kind of useful but the point is to the extent it could have a use someday assuming the government doesn't uh, corrupt it too much. Um, uh, copyright law could be an impediment and slow it down. That's all I'm saying. So you haven't used uh, ChatGPT with your uh, uh, lawyering and attorney work? <laughs> well, I'm basically, I'm basically retired, so I don't need to. But I, I, I could see how it could be useful, like an enhanced, um, an enhanced Google search on occasion. And I, I've seen like David Vexler, my friend. He, he's 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 getting good at using it to, I don't know, generate tables of like when to water your plants and things like that. But I, the thing is, you can't trust it, and it doesn't have any intentionality, and it's not uh, conscious, um, and it's also hobbled, of course, by you know you can't use it for nudes or porn, and and you can't use it for things that they think is racist. So it's it's like the whole thing is like. Already gimped and hobbled, and uh, uh, we'll we'll see what happens with it. But uh, I, I I don't I don't I don't see I, I don't I don't see it's really going to put white collar workers out of business anytime soon. You mentioned there's uh, criminal penalties for copyright violation. Um, are there similar penalties for patent violation, or how is that enforced? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. There's there's something called uh, enhanced damages for what's called willful infringement. So uh, let's say I infringe someone's patent and they can prove that I've damaged them. <laughs> I've damaged them because they weren't able to sell their as many things at a monopoly price as they could have with being able to, to, to stop competition. So let's say I damaged them to the tune of $5 million. Um, if I was aware of their patent and I did it anyway… Like instead of like unknowingly, I did it willfully, which is one reason you will have companies send a letter to you and they say, We think you're you're violating our patent. It's patent number X. Here it is. We we insist that you stop. Now they have a record showing that you were from that day forward at least, you were aware of the patent and you were willfully infringing it. So then the damages can be trebled, triple tripled. Um, but I'm I'm not aware of any criminal penalties for copy for patent infringement. Now, for trade secret, trade secret is largely a state thing, but there is a federal criminal trade secret thing, which I think also has criminal penalties. But yeah, copyright is serious because um, if you guys remember, there's this guy named Aaron Schwartz who was the guy that helped invent RSS, and he was brilliant young coder, and you know he snuck into some server room at Columbia or one of the universities, and he. He, he, he downloaded all their academic articles they had from one of these databases, and he used his laptop and used their broadband to upload like thousands of these, you know, like law review articles or like academic papers. He, he uploaded them to the internet, like big deal. <laughs> and, he, and he got caught. He was facing like 20 years to life in federal prison for just uploading academic articles to the internet. And so he he committed suicide. He killed himself because he, he couldn't handle it. There was a guy I remember. I mean, there's lots of stories, but uh, maybe 15 years ago, remember the Wolverine movie? Um, some guy uploaded one copy of Wolverine to the internet, and he he went to federal prison for for one year. There was a there was a rich uh, there was a, a a a UK grad student named I think Richard O'Dwyer, um, and he had a website. And on his website, he had links. He didn't. He didn't have pirated content, but he had links to, like, servers in Russia or China or somewhere to which which themselves hosted pirated copies of of Hollywood movies and things like this. And the U.S. tried to extradite this guy to the U.S. from Britain to face federal criminal charges in jail, and like his whole grad student career was disrupted for three years. 
I mean, he was fearing being sent from Britain to America to go to federal fucking prison for having a website that had hyperlinks on it. That's all. He finally won, or he finally got, got it to be dropped, but his, his life was like made a nightmare for five years or something. It was crazy. So it's, it's a real threat. It's serious. So when it's domestic only, how could they argue that a Brit that's never been to America broke a American federal law? I, th I don't know the details. I assume they were arguing he was violating British copyright law because, oh, okay. because right. there's the, Ber the Berne Convention, basically, which all the, all the countries of the world, or all, almost every country that I'm aware of, uh, is part of the Berne Convention, which requires every, every country that's a member to have a copyright law with certain minimum standards. Uh, in fact, the U.S. didn't join that until 1988 because we didn't like the um, – the moral rights aspects of it. So I think we got an exception for that. But it, but the Berne Convention, re, 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 the U.S. had strong copyright law internally, but we we for a long time you could pirate foreign works. I think Charles Dickens hate he was pissed off about that. Like you could buy pirated copies of Great Expectations and shit. So so he wasn't making as much money as he could in the U.S. So he he went on tour here, doing speeches to make some money from his loving audience, and then he he. Uh, this is one of the stupid defenses of, of IP. Uh, I think I can't remember who made this argument. I've got it on my website somewhere, but someone says, you know, Charles Dickens had to come to America and tour to make money off speeches, and then he got pneumonia and died. So basically, the lack of copyright killed Charles Dickens. <laughs> it's like, come on. <laughs> it's crazy. So I suspect that Dwyer was um, uh, in violation of, um, of, of the British version of copyright law, and uh, probably under some treaty, he could be. Hauled into court in the U.S. because the victims were American, something like that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Would you say that uh, the patent regime in the U.S. is getting worse right now? In what ways is it getting worse? And no. No, I don't like, think it's getting worse. I, th I think my guess is copyright and patent have both reached their limit. Like I I, do, hmm. I doubt there's going to be any more extension of patent copyright terms because it's just so ridiculous. It's life of the author plus 70 years now in the US. And I, I'm sure they're going to try to add another 20 years onto it like they did 20 years ago. Um, but I don't think they're going to get that. Now, the one thing is I do think copyright law will keep getting worse because they're going to gradually keep adding these um these um these things about um uh uh, like they might shrink the Section 230 and the and the DMCA safe harbor back a little bit, uh, or they might enhance the penalties. Uh, so, th 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 but they're going to go after enforcement, and that that would be an increased threat to to the internet. Um, mm. As for patent, if you talk to patent attorneys and patent whores, people that are in favor of the system, they will say that the patent system has gradually been undermined and gotten weaker in the last two decades, three decades. And to a degree, they have a little bit of a point, not in terms of the law. Uh, the law is irrelevant. The statute was changed under Obama, but it, it, it was changed in, 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 in trivial ways from the point of view of the average victim of, of – like, for example, we went from a first-to-file system – I'm sorry. We went from a first-to-invent system to a first-to-file system primarily because – Basically, every other country on the earth has a first-to-file system, and we want, it, we want it to be like them. Uh, but so all that means is in some cases, inventor A will win the battle instead of inventor B. But from the point of view of the industry, it doesn't matter whether inventor A or B owns it because it's the, the threat to innovation is still still the same thing. I, don't, I mean if I'm going to be shaken down or extorted by someone, it, it, I'm not going to be upset that it was inventor B instead of inventor A. Oh, I wish it was – I wish it was the guy that was the first to invent instead of the first to file that's, that's suing me for a billion dollars. It doesn't matter. Um, there have been some court decisions which have um, – and to my mind, they're all roughly favorable because they slightly reduce the 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 damage done by the patent system. So one example was a case I don't know several years back, um, <clears throat> where it made it a little bit harder to get an injunction to enforce a patent. So before this decision, I think it was about seven, eight, nine years ago, um, maybe it's called Alice. I can't remember. But um, before then, if you if you won your patent infringement lawsuit against someone. You pretty much had an automatic right to get the court to issue an injunction where the court says you must stop selling this product. 
um, it was like automatic. It was just given like as a as a result of winning. But I think this court case basically said, no, you don't get injunctions automatically. You have to satisfy a three part test, and you can't always satisfy that. So like basically damages, monetary damages. Or in many cases, enough to satisfy you. So you could just ask for money from your victim instead of an injunction. Uh, and and so some of the proponents of IP as a copyright, I'm sorry, patent as a property right, they think that that undermines its its state its status as a property right because you can you know if you own a house, you don't just get damages of someone squatting in it, you get to kick them out, right? So they think that if you actually have a property right in a, in an invention, you should be able to get an injunction as a matter of course. But now it's harder. So. But it should be harder because injunctions are, are horrible. <laughs> uh, and there's a couple other things like you know maybe uh, some abstract ideas are not going to be subject to patents that would have been, but it's roughly the same as it used to be. I don't think it's, I don't think patents will get any worse or any better. They're not uh, what, doing anything like increasing patent terms no, or anything no, like no, that. No. Okay. No. No. Is there a fair use equivalent in patent law, something no. like that? No. no. There's something in patent law called the doctrine of equivalence. And the doctrine of equivalence says that um, when you have a patent, the patent right is what's defined in the claims. Let's say claim one, and it's defined by what they call the limitations of the claim or the elements of the claim. So let's say you have a claim with, say, four elements. A, B, C, and D. That means that any competing device that has that has elements A, B, C, and D will be infringing. Okay. Um, what most people have a hard time understanding is so if you have a competing device that has element E, it's still infringing because it has it has elements A, B, C, and D. That's why a chair would infringe a, a patent on the stool because a chair is a stool. A chair is a special type of stool because the chair still has a seat and legs, and that's all the patent. So the patents patents have the word comprising, which means includes. It doesn't mean consists only of. If you had a patent claim that said, "I I claim a sitting device consisting exactly of um, a seat and three legs," well, then if you had a stool that had four legs, it wouldn't be infringing. Or if you had a seat, a, a stool with a, with a back, it wouldn't be infringing because it wouldn't be exactly only a seat and legs. But that's why patent lawyers don't claim it as consisting. They say comprising, includes, right? So it just means the competing device just has to have that bare set of elements, even if it has other things. Now, under the doctrine of equivalence, let's suppose – Let's suppose I had a patent on something, and it was – let's say I had a stool, and I said – let's say I had a, a, a patent um, on, a, um, on a stool, and I said I claim a sitting device having a seat and three legs nailed to the, to the seat. And someone else says, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to use a screw instead of a nail. To get around the patent because the patent says nails. It doesn't say screw. Well, then under the doctrine of equivalence, the court might say, well, in this case, the screw is a functional equivalent of the nail. And so so like my, my, my patent has elements A, B, C, and D, and the competing device has elements A, B, C, and D prime. Well, if D prime is effectively the equivalent of, of D, then it still might be infringing. So if anything, it's the other way around. Um, right. right, yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Anything at all? Anything about IP law? Policy? Practice? So in practice, how many new patents do you get? Like, are they issued every week on a Monday? Or uh, how often I, do you even have to read the news to know if you're impacted or not? Well, that, that, that's what that's part of the, the the problem with this. You know, you know how like in the law we say that ignorance of law is no excuse, which which makes right. sense if law is natural law because everyone, you know, the idea is that natural law is engraven on your heart. Every you you can't say, oh, I, I raped this girl, but I didn't know I wasn't supposed to rape her. Like you can't claim ignorance of the law if it's natural law or murder or whatever, you know. But if it's arbitrary law, thousands of statutes, and no one, no one even knows how many, 
no one knows what the law is and no one knows how many laws there are. Like no one even knows this, right? Maybe, maybe chat GPT can figure out someday. But I mean, it's it's I think when laws made artificially by statute, it actually ignorance of the law should be an excuse, in my opinion, but but unfortunately it's not. Um same thing with the patent system. It's impossible to keep up with it. Uh, patents are issued, if I recall, every Tuesday, once a week, they're issued. Um, but no, no one keeps track. In fact, like I said earlier, if you're aware of a patent, then you might be guilty of willful damages or treble damages. So there's also there's almost an incentive to keep your head in the sand and not to not investigate the patents out there because. If you're making a new device, you kind of don't want to know if it's covered by a patent because that's only going to make you potentially liable for more damages down the road. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't keep up. Now, if if you if you want to go into a certain area, you you can pay someone to do a patent search in a given area, and there are hundreds of subcategories in the patent office the way that patents are done. But of course, it's impossible to scientifically do this right. Um, because it's it's arbitrary categories. Yeah, insane. Thank you. I want to thank uh, your time for putting this together. I think uh, this completes finally my Mises Institute uh, curriculum. I think I missed you at uh, 2016 uh, in Ashburn, Alabama. Uh, but you did write a uh, sign that book for me uh, against intellectual property. So I appreciate that very much. All right. And, uh, this course that you provide. Well, so my plan is uh, I think I'll go on and close now. Um, but I think my, my plan is um, maybe if everyone thinks is a good idea, I welcome you. Maybe in the email we, we wrote earlier, you can write me back and let, give me your thoughts on this. Um, I maybe do another one of these next week or something like that uh, on copyright. And then if there's room for another one or anything else, we could do that too. But uh, that, but it, at least it would be good to have like um, one good recorded thing like this on the kind of nuts and bolts of how the system works um, so that people like understand these laws that, that I've been railing against for so long and that we're talking about the policy uh, aspects of. So I guess I'll let everybody – unless there's any final question, I'll let – any, any final comments or questions? I just think that the copyright one is going to need a lot longer Q&A. <laughs> uh, that's fine. All right. I could even do like, you know, I can start the Q&A and then if it we need another one, I'll do a, a, a second Q&A to extend it. So that's not a problem. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have, have, a, good, uh, have a good day. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you, Kinsella. Bye-bye. Thanks. It was a very good meeting. Thanks.